so we are going to start using your textbook. If you don't have your textbook yet, work hard to get it. It was a 10-point assignment for you to have it installed by today. I know there are technical issues, but you have to be the bird dog. You have to um, hunt your parents down and say, hey, where's my textbook code? What? You didn't purchase my book? Hey, could you help me with that? Um, and see me so that I know that you're working on it. Um, there's no late fee if you are working on it, like you purchased it and you're waiting for your code in the email. And your textbook is a tool that we're going to use often. There are assignments that are only available if you have it installed in My Lab and Mastering. Question back? It was due last night. Yeah. And I did update your Aries to show whether or not I have received your textbook. There's nothing to turn in at the assignment. I'm just looking for you to have your username in the, my textbook here at Canvas. So number one was ecologist. Number two was ecosystem. And we're on number three. What is the relationship between a landscape and an ecosystem? We're in chapter 34, section one. And it goes over the level of organization that we already know from before. So I'm just going to go down here to the bottom. I'm at the very bottom of this page. And there it is. What's the relationship between landscapes and ecosystems? Landscapes can contain many ecosystems. The land that you might look at over the horizon from left to right is going to have many different ecosystems inside of it. So a landscape is bigger. <laughs> so before we said, <laughs> excuse me, the, that the uh, <laughs> ecosystems make up the biosphere, but now ecosystems make up landscapes, and landscapes make up the biosphere. Let's move on to the next page. It works out that every page is a decimal to the chapter. So 34.2 in the physical book, this would be like page 2 of the chapter. Depending on how wide you make your screen, it can be longer or shorter. So it's, it's dynamic. This second topic is the science of ecology provides insight into problems in the environment. In the 1950s and 60s, they thought nature was a force to be tamed. And there's a lot of natural resources that can be utilized for our benefit in making products, making money, having businesses. So it was kind of up for grabs without much regard for what we might do with pollution in the environment. And the most widely used chemical to get rid of insects was called DDT. That's a really bad name now in the environment. It sticks around. It gets into the plants that they spray it on to kill the insects like mosquitoes. It, and then the first consumers eat the plants and get this chemical in them. The second consumers eat the first consumers and get that chemical in them. All the way up to humans. And humans can get DDT and chemicals inside of us as well. So what is an organically grown food? It's supposed to be a food that isn't grown with pesticides or herbicides because there are residues of these chemicals on the vegetables at the grocery store. You should wash off your vegetables to uh, get those off. It even turns out that they have gone a step farther and they have designed plants and animals to have chemicals inside of them. For example, corn and soybeans are grown 
and manipulated by a company called Monsanto, and they put the pesticides inside the seed. So as it grows, it's got the pesticide and it's disease resistant, pesticide resistant. So there's no way of separating it, even washing it. That's why some people are concerned about GMOs, genetically modified organisms, because of the way that it may have been designed to have some chemicals inside of it. We're going to have a unit on nutrition, and we'll talk more about this later. It's the business of food. You should know it. So it's really interesting and a necessary part of our class. So look at this picture. You'd be concerned about that if you were at the beach and a vehicle comes by and spray stuff. Like, is this just like Halloween smoke? What are you doing here? Back in the 50s, 60s, people would wonder the same thing but have no idea of the consequences of breathing these chemicals in or getting it in your your food or your water. They used to drive down the street in neighborhoods. I can remember it when I was growing up in Minnesota in the months that have mosquitoes that were horrible. They would drive down the street. They would let you know. They would tell you stay indoors, but, you know, we're kids, so... We didn't really think that it was much of a big deal. And you just try to avoid it, but then it's in the environment, so it's kind of scary. Nowadays, they don't do that. But you should be concerned about anything that comes out of a can or a lotion, right? Even like Lysol. Oh, wow, this is like, smells fresh, right? But it's chemicals that are going into the air. Why do we need it? So a lot of cleaning supplies, too, that are in your house leave a residue that can add up. So sometimes allergies that people have are from the toxins they put in their own house. But definitely be, be aware of that. So what does DDT do? Question four. They didn't know it but they were killing off birds because the DDT caused the eggshells of species to be really fragile. The birds would not come to term and they would, their eggs would crack prematurely and so they wouldn't make it. That was for bald eagles, eagles, osprey, peregrine falcons, a lot of birds in North America and Europe. Um, and we nearly caused their extinction because we didn't want mosquitoes. The next question is about this book, Silent Spring, in 1962. This is question five. The author is Rachel Carson. She was uh, a talented writer, and she started writing about pollution in the environment and she drew the public awareness into debates so she was a very good uh, advocate of being good stewards of the environment as humans we're, we're caretakers for the planet and we weren't doing a good job with all this pollution so in the 70s, it started a host of new laws aimed at curbing pollution and cleaning up the environment. And to this day, it's always a big topic, right? I'm going to switch to the next page. Yeah. The dangers of chemicals in the environment or pollution. We're on question number six. I'm going to highlight this, and gold is a good color here for solar energy from the sun is captured in photosynthesis to make sugar. This is 
what plants do. Plants are the primary producers. They power most ecosystems. And up until about 1985, that was really the extent of what we thought, that all life started with photosynthesis, and they powered the fuel for consumers to eat. But then they found microorganisms that can live in extreme environments. So I'm going to highlight this in dark environments such as caves and hydrothermal vents, miles beneath the ocean surface uh, where it's complete darkness. And uh, maybe I'll make that in pink or like red. They also go through primary production, but not with sunlight. They take the toxic chemicals coming out of the bottom of the ocean. These are called inorganic because they're not in living things. Sulfur and hydrogen sulfate and all these dangerous chemicals. The bacteria take this and they make sugar just like photosynthesis does. So it's called chemosynthesis. So the answer to question number six is, this is false. Life can exist in dark environments like caves and at the bottom of the ocean at hydrothermal vents. So you have to make it true by saying, by crossing out no, life can exist. Here's, here's kind of what they look like. Remember, bacteria do this. So this isn't bacteria. Bacteria are microscopically small. You can't see them with your naked eye. The bacteria live inside the tissues of these worms right here. These worms can grow to be six feet tall. They're called tube worms. This brown is the tube, and this is their filter feeders. They'll come up like that and extend their feathery appendages to grab stuff floating in the water and then to hide they'll go and hide down in there but living in their tissue is this extremophile bacteria do you remember from the last test what do you call the domain for extreme bacteria that can do this yes RKE bacteria correct the bacteria live in the tissues of these worms and feed them about 75% of the fuel they need. They make glucose. So the worms grow really well. And then along comes a crab and other secondary um, consumers. And they eat the worms. So the bottom of the food chain is not a plant down there. It is bacteria living in the worms. <laughs> And they just found this out in the mid-80s. So we'll move on to question number um, seven now. Abiotic factors are things that are not alive. So here we are in the textbook chapter and section three and chapter 34, and it's got the heading, temperature. Temperature isn't alive. That's an abiotic factor. <laughs> Three abiotic factors that influence organisms in their habitat. Definitely temperature. Some animals can handle cold. Some can handle heat. Some have to have it just right. That's why they're in a particular area on our planet. The next one. The availability of water. Some animals and plants can do with very little water. There's even a mouse that can live in the desert. It doesn't even have to drink water. It gets water from the food that it eats and digesting it. When we study this, you'll learn that your digestive tract makes water when it breaks the food apart, breaks the bonds, and, and it releases hydrogen and oxygen, and then combines the two and it makes water. But water is definitely uh, something abiotic factor that animals have to contend with and make sure they get enough of. The third abiotic factor are other nutrients that are called inorganic. 
if you want to make a little note for yourself and say inorganic is a chemical that is not in living things, organic is a molecule that you will find in living things that is part of our makeup. Carbohydrates, fats, and proteins are organic. Vitamins are inorganic. Vitamin C, vitamin D, enzymes. These are inorganic. If you've helped out with gardening before and you've added fertilizer, what is the main component of fertilizer? Anybody know? It has three letters on the bag. These are inorganic nutrients that plants need in order to grow. Anybody? Nitrogen is the main one. Potassium. And phosphorus. Those are the three main uh, inorganic ones. So on every fertilizer, next time you're at Home Depot and walk by it, they have three numbers on the bag, and the numbers are for each one of those. Some plants need more nitrogen, some need more phosphorus, some need more potassium. So that is the third abiotic factor. It was temperature, water, and inorganic nutrients. Question seven also says, what are the biotic factors? And describe adaptations that organisms owe it. So it's just uh, abiotic. Oh, that's coming up in question nine when it talks about the biotic factors. So they need to have adaptations for this to conserve energy or to store water. Like a succulent stores water because it's meant to grow an environment that has very little water. So when it rains, like in the desert, very infrequently, it can store that water and last almost a whole year. Now we'll move on to the next question. What two factors can explain the presence of a species in a particular area? I'm clicking into the section four in our textbook. <clears throat> Question eight, what two factors can explain the presence of a species in a particular area? In other, in other words, it means, why is that animal there? Number one, it was born there. His parents live there, and his, that organism, plant or animal, will live there. Aren't you here because this is the home of your parents? So I highlighted the text right here. I'm in section four, if you want to highlight that up near the top. The species may have evolved from ancestors living in that location, or they may have come in and been able to survive and live. <clears throat> it wasn't long ago that people were really born and lived and died within 30 miles of where they were born with the advent of easy travel now people are moving all over the planet but that's why we have certain uh, characteristics of people. The ones that live near the poles, the Inuit Indians or Eskimos, they're shorter. They're more round. They have more body mass for more body heat to stay warm. Their skin is light in color because what low light they have up at the North Pole, they can absorb more light through their light skin. You need to have sunlight to make vitamin D. If not, you have a lot of uh, physical conditions. 
Vitamin D is so important that it's also in milk. You notice the carton says vitamin D fortified. So they've added that to uh, milk because a lot of young people drink milk and you need that to grow properly. But the people that live near the equator, they're tall and skinny. They're like radiators. They have more body surface and less body mass, so they radiate heat more because it's hotter there. And their skin is darker in color so that they absorb less of the sun's radiation and it bounces off. Sunlight is not a problem for them, so their skin is protecting them from too much sun radiation. So that's how humans have evolved and changed because that is what was successful in those areas. So what if the tall, dark-skinned people found themselves in the North Pole and couldn't get away? They would suffer. Similarly, the, the ones that are light-skinned and round and short and massive, they are going to suffer at the equator. So... What makes you um, able to survive in a new area? If, you can't, if you're suffering and can't get out, you might not make it to adulthood and have offspring. Think about other plants and animals instead of just humans now. It turns out that a lot of boaters are inconvenienced by taking their boat from one lake to another. You have to get it inspected and you have to get a sticker and probably pay a fee for that inspection. Because on the boat, on the axle, you didn't even know there was a weed in there. As you put your trailer out in the water or your propeller has a weed, it gets in that lake, it does really well, and takes over the whole lake's plants. Obliterates all of the uh, indigenous plants and replaces it with an invasive species. So that is right here. If life gets dispersed in a new location, sometimes by our carelessness, it can take over and disrupt the balance of nature. So these are examples of question number eight. How can a species do well in a particular area? It grew up there. It is adapted from generation after generation. Its DNA becomes selected to do well in that area. But if you uh, inadvertently or other animals take the opportunity to go to a new area, they might be able to outcompete. Number nine. We're talking about this pronghorn antelope. It's similar, but not the exact one that you saw in the video Serengeti. Wasn't that impressive when the leopard jumped out of the tree from a pretty good height? and then carried it up the tree. That was impressive. Yeah, he dropped it. That was crazy too. So what two factors can explain the presence of, oh wait, uh, listen to describe an adaptation that these guys have, abiotic and biotic. Here's abiotic. They live in very dry, very windy, and extreme temperature fluctuations, both cold and hot. That's really hard on animals. These guys are able to survive and reproduce under these conditions because, here's a fancy word for DNA, alleles. We all have two copies of genes, and the copies are called alleles. So because they've lived there and their ancestors, their DNA presupposes them to do well in that area, their DNA, uh, through subsequent generations. So animals that we find in a particular area, they are now s selected by nature to do well. If you, if you couldn't, you died off and never had offspring. So the survivors keep refining their genes in that area. That's abiotic. They are able to handle uh, because of genes that give them 
special hormones and different body features, those highly ordered structures. And then what about the biotic factor? So I'm highlighting some text. If you have your text, you can highlight as well. The biotic means that what does it eat? What eats it? So the pronghorn's main food is small plants, so they design teeth to chew the plants. And woody shrubs, so these are hard to chew, so they, over time, they produce organized structures in their body to exploit these food sources more efficiently than other types of deer. <laughs> in the second semester we're going to talk a lot about this it's called natural selection and this is how species come into being really interesting topic for for later specify <laughs> got that for question number eight no excuse me nine and we're almost done we're going to talk about the weather So you'll notice that I'm zipping through a lot of the text. Sometimes we read paragraphs in class. If we don't read it in class, you're still responsible for the information. So I recommend that you spend some time looking it over. If this is the only time you see the textbook, you might get a C on the quiz. So you've got to uh, spend some time with the tools which are flashcards, practice questions, and the text itself. Yes? The biotic factor deals with other animals that eat it. So it developed really fast jumping muscles and quick turning and maneuverability. So if, if you had that physical skill to avoid being caught and you have offspring, your offspring probably are like that. And whatever they, they eat, um, grass and really woody shrubs. So they have the teeth and digestive tract to break that down. You become highly ordered structured for playing offense and defense. That's a good way of putting it. You're able to eat that stuff because you've got the digestive tract for it. <clears throat> Question number 10. We're in section five, the last section of the textbook for today. <laughs> this is a key picture. The sun is much stronger at the equator. And the reason why is because it's at a 90 degree angle. The sun is directly overhead. If you go outside right now, it is just a little after 12, 2 o'clock, and the sun is at an angle like that. It's, it's already pretty far south. It's not straight over our head. So our sun is at about a 60 degree angle like that, and it's not being absorbed by the earth as much. At the equator, they get the most heat absorption, so that's why it's hotter there. And the poles have about a 45 degree angle or less the farther north you go. And so the sun is at a more, um, is that obtuse? Uh, I think that's called obtuse when it's less, a uh, lesser angle. So the Earth has unequal heating based on where the sun is. Is the Earth at an axis straight up and down like this? It's at a tilt. Anybody know what the angle is? Is it on side? No. Straight up? No. Halfway? No. It's about right there. Anybody know what the angle is? 63 would put it at about, this is 45, so no. 
Uh, it is 23.5. Kind of noteworthy to write down on question number 10. The seasons of the year result from the tilt of the earth on its axis. This 23.5 degree tilt on its axis. That's the answer to this question. The seasons of the year are because the earth is tilted at 23.5 degrees of, of the earth on its axis. So it spins around, that's a day. But it also goes around the sun. The sun doesn't go around us. So we're up here, North America. The northern hemisphere tilts toward the sun. So, yeah, it's just a little closer to the sun. But the bigger thing is it's got more of the 90 degree. If you are at 23.5 degrees, let me go back up to this picture. This dashed line right here, this is 23.5 degrees. The equator is the zero degrees latitude line, and this dashed line called the Tropic of Cancer is at 23.5 degrees. So on the first day of summer, the sun is directly overhead. On the first day of winter, down here in the southern hemisphere, that's 23.5 degrees. That's the first day of their summer, the first day of our winter in the northern hemisphere. So now if you look at this picture right here, in our summer, the sun is at 23.5 degrees. That's the tilt of the Earth, the Tropic of Cancer. And down here at the Tropic of Capricorn, that's 23.5. That will be the sun will be directly overhead on the first day of winter. The seasons change on a particular day at a particular minute and a particular second, depending on when it hits that bottom line and when it crosses the equator. Right now, we are in September. That's when the season changes to fall. In three days, the sun is going to be right over the equator, making an exact 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness everywhere on the planet. It's called an equinox because it's going, the sun will be right over the equator. It's called a solstice when the sun, sol, hits its... Highest or lowest point, the sun reaches its epoch height on uh, June 21st, sometimes 22nd, sometimes 23rd. And so that's what changes the seasons as the earth goes around the sun. Now we'll look at this picture and you guys will become a little bit like weatherman. It's really hot at the equator. The sun is the most intense right at the equator. From 23 degrees north and 23 degrees south, this is the tropics. They get a lot of sun's direct. There are no seasons in the tropic. It's always summer. So the sun is making the Earth's temperature really warm. Hot air rises, right? Hot air can hold a lot of moisture. Is the air hotter closer to the sun or is it colder up here? Colder. Yep. If you've flown in an airplane and watched the screen in front of you, they usually display your airspeed, usually about 500 miles an hour, and the temperature. It will be somewhere between zero and minus 40, even on a day like today. It's cold up there. So the hot air rises, it's carrying all this moisture, and then it comes out of its gas and goes into liquid, condensing and falling back down as rain. So you have wet air going up and then the moisture has been removed and you have dry air descending and it absorbs moisture as it comes down. Hey, what goes up creates a void, right? Hot air rises, there's nothing here. So air has to rush in from the sides to take its place. Hot air goes up, Something has to come in to take its place. So weather goes in patterns like this. 
and it goes in circles. Here it is again. Hot air rises, it's going to release its moisture, come back down, it's dry, and get heated up as it comes across. These are called trade winds. The earth is fatter at the middle. It travels through more space. So it's actually turning faster at the equator and slower at the poles. So it's going to swish all the water in this direction. As the earth is spinning that direction, the water lags behind and goes from right to left. So does the wind goes from right to left. So there's a pattern of going this way and then there's a pattern of going that way. Every 30 degrees there is no wind. There's no wind at the equator. You want to sail, it's just going to be like this. The sails aren't going to move because the air is going up. The air is going down so there really isn't much wind carrying across the surface. These are called the doldrums. There's a doldrum at zero, there's a doldrum at 30, there's a doldrum at 60, but in between, right here, it's really windy. I grew up right here in uh, Minnesota, and it's right there in, in the windy part. We're down here, so we don't get much wind. We're close to the doldrums, but when you get in the trade winds, the trade winds can blow from 30 to 60 miles an hour. Airplanes, they'll go and they will fly from here and they'll usually fly up a little bit to catch the trade winds. And if you've ever ridden a bike with a tailwind, you know you don't even have to pedal much. And your speed is a lot faster. You try to bike into the wind and it's going to slow you down, take more energy. So airplanes uh, are traveling from California to New York much faster than from New York to California. So let's answer the question. Number 11. Which of the following winds are from the east to the west as a result of the faster spin at the equator? Which one is it? Yep, they're called the trade winds, but you could also call them the easterlies. So they're the easterly trade winds. Because they're coming from the east, and so they're named after where they come from. At the equator, up to 30 degrees, the wind blows from the east to the west. We're slightly up here, we're, we're slightly at the bottom of the westerly, so we know that our weather blows in um, from the ocean and then goes all the way across over to New York. List the factors that can contribute to ocean currents. Here are the ocean currents. Just like the weather patterns, because the earth is spinning faster at the equator and less up here, the water is rushing across this way from the east to the west. It's hot water. My friend lives right here in Florida. I asked him, what's the temperature of the water? And he goes, Oh, it's like 85, 95 degrees. <laughs> Pretty warm, right? They can even reach 100 degrees here in the Gulf. That's why hurricanes gain strength as they're coming in right here, picking up all this hot water and moisture from the heat near the equator and rising up in some pretty good storms. Here we are. We have a current that comes from the North Pole and it's a cold current. It's starting to get warmed up as it gets down toward us. But if you are a surfer, you know that you're going to wear, start wearing your wetsuit pretty soon because the water's cold. 60 degrees, low 60s. So can you answer the question number 10? What is contributing to ocean currents? The fast spin of water at the equator and the warm water at the equator and the cold water coming in to take its place as it moves out of the way. All ocean currents are connected 
As the warm current moves across the equator, it's replaced by cold water coming in from the, the north or south pole. And the last question, 13. What two factors primarily define terrestrial biomes? A biome is a major geographic area for plants and animals. On the land, they're determined primarily by temperature and rainfall. I highlighted it. Uh, hard to see, though. Temperature and precipitation or rain. In the ocean, they don't have a problem with water. In the, the ocean temperature is pretty constant, even though I gave you the extreme ranges. So the different abiotic factors are based on salinity. The water is saltier near the equator because more water is going up in the atmosphere, leaving the salt behind. At the equator, you have a lot of ice that melts in the summer and puts fresh water into the ocean. So the higher you go toward the poles, the less salt. I'm sure you've all had a mouthful of ocean water when you're at the um, seashore, and it tastes really salty. But that's only 3% salt. 97% of the ocean is fresh water, 3% salt. But that varies. It can get close to 4 at the equator and 2 near the poles. All right, we're going to now get you set up for the lab that is due tomorrow night. By the way, this worksheet isn't due as homework, even though it has a due date of the 27th. Don't worry about um, doing it yourself. We're going to cover that in class. So can you go over to Canvas and grab the file? Oops, it's not a file. It, it is a website. Go over here to Space Eco Voyage. You can find it in our to-do list or in the module, Space Eco Voyage.